these times, but are we listening? Well, we hope that you will listen and hear Revelation. That's why we're here on Hope Today, and we're so excited for you to be joining us on this Thursday. I'm here with Tom Hollis and Angela Madden. And Tom, we are going to have an incredible conversation about what God is doing, what he's trying to wake up the church and help us understand what he's doing in this season. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Rick Joyner is going to be with us. He's written a book called Overcoming Evil in the Last Days. And you know, he's got three areas. You're going to find about three strongholds that are really, uh, you know, something that has locked down in our society and even in the church sometimes and how we can overcome them. So you're not going to want to miss that. Yeah. Angel, what are your thoughts on when it comes to last days and what God is speaking and doing in this season? Oh, he's doing so much. And I think all of us as believers feel it and sense it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, Rick Joyner has uh, wrote a book uh, years ago called uh, The Final Quest that uh, a few of us we were just sharing has like had such a profound impact on us. Uh, and, uh, I, I had no idea. Uh, Angela, you said it did. Uh, Sydney, uh, you as well. Linda, uh, our, our makeup artist, said the same thing. And so that's that's what you know. Um, you know, God's in it is when it's having that effect uh, uh, over various lives. Yes, I mean, I remember reading that book and being so profoundly impacted by the battle and recognizing we truly are in a war, you know, and to be affixed with the proper tools. And I'm excited to get into this new space with Rick and understand what he's bringing forward today. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we truly are in a battle. You know, I just think about, you know, a lot of times there's so many people I know, even in this season, that they feel like they're wearing down. There's this wearing down of the saints. But sometimes, you know, God has just been shown to me the, the greater, you know, the greater the battle that he is revealing his glory in us. Because when we overcome, we can share how we can, you know, others can overcome as well. So just want to even let you know if that you're wrestling with something, if you feel like there's a battle surrounding you, we always have our prayer line that is available at 888-665-4483. We are always here to stand with you and to pray with you because guess what? We are in this together and we are victorious in Christ. Yeah, so be sure to take advantage of that. And I just want to say something. We, we probably don't say this enough. I just want to thank you all that, that uh, participate in this ministry. You know, we, we uh, appreciate you. We appreciate, we cannot do this except for those of you that, that, that partake of, uh, you know, your donations into this ministry and, the, and your prayers. My goodness, Sydney, how could we, how could we do this without the, the participation of God's people in this ministry? You know, one thing I love about Cornerstone Television Network that produces Hope Today, if you're watching in Pittsburgh or Florida or anywhere around the world, even on YouTube, is that it is truly a family and it takes all of us coming together to do this kingdom work. I think of our founders, Russ and Norma Bixler, that their heart was everyone ought to know who Jesus is. So we are about spreading the hope of the gospel because, you know, Angela, that truly is what we stand on. Our hope is in him and him Absolutely. alone. He anchors our soul in the wild waves of life. He anchors our soul. And what a victorious, glorious hope we have today. Absolutely. So thank you again for that. Well, Dr. Rick Joyner, he's coming up right now. He's our next guest. He is the founder and executive director of Morningstar Ministries. If you've never been on their website, they've got some great stuff there. You need to check it out. He's also a prophetic leader and an author. And in his newest book, Overcoming Evil in the Last Days, Rick exposes Satan's three most powerful evil strongholds that are currently plaguing our culture. Rick, it's so great to have you with us on Hope Today. Well, thank you. I love the name of your show. <laughs> we need that hope. We do we need have that hope. <clears throat> Let me just ask you about, uh, you know, something in the title kind of begs the question. In your view, are, are we in the last days? Are we in that season where we can expect seeing Christ return soon? Uh, I do believe that, but I believe uh, it could be anywhere from the imminent future to decades away. Uh, there's still a lot left to be accomplished, including the greatest harvest that the world's ever known. But I believe we're poised for that right now. I think we're seeing the, the signs of the very first stages of what I believe is gonna be the greatest of all the great awakenings and the greatest end gathering there has ever been into the body of Christ. That's what Jesus said. The end of the age is the harvest. Mm -hmm. It's the end gathering. So, you know, I think we should be focusing on that. And, you know, Peter wrote about the incredible concept of hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And, uh, you know, I've pondered that for 50 years now. How can we speed 
things up and uh, hasten the coming of his kingdom that his people have been praying for for nearly 2,000 years. The one prayer he gave us, that his kingdom would come. What an awesome time that's going to be. But we have work to do, and let's do it now. Let's get engaged so we can hasten the day of his coming. Yeah, I, uh, likewise. I have pondered that verse. You know, we can, we can just blow right by that. But hastening God's timeline. Isn't that a, an amazing concept? Um, and, and in fact, we're seeing uh, reports of people turning, even in the Middle East, Ar Iran right now, many reports of, of tens of thousands of people coming to Christ out of Islam. It's, a, it's an exciting time to see what God's going to do. No question about it. And listen, what he's doing is seldom carried on the news. Some of the most profound things he's been doing in America which a friend of mine, I think, did the greatest, most extensive study on America, the heart of America today, that has ever been done, I've ever even heard of. And it's revealed that the American people have gone almost the exact opposite direction that the media would have us to think they've gone. They have gone strong towards conservative values. Now, that does not mean they've turned towards the Republican Party. They have not. They don't trust the Amer uh, Republican Party pretty much, which I think our recent election revealed. But as far as conservative family values, the American people have been turning very strongly back to those traditional values. To me, there's been a great awakening going on that's unseen. And uh, the people are lining up with God and his purposes and don't know it. Many of them do not know these are biblical purposes, biblical standards and things like that, but something in their heart they're responding to. And that's of course what the what Paul wrote about Romans 1. God has revealed this in all of our hearts. He put his law in our hearts and people are getting in touch with that as they're losing their trust in government that has in many ways tried to become our God, mm -hmm. our source, and all these things. Well, people are turning back to what is the only solid foundation we can build our life on. Well, that's an encouraging word to hear because that almost sounds like God is preparing the ground for that outpouring, for the gospel, when people are beginning to embrace the, the, the tenets of, of truth without really understanding the truth yet. Oh, I think that's exactly what it is. And the findings of this study were shocking. It was exactly the opposite of what we were expecting to see. And uh, I tell you, God has been at work. And you know, he even says in one place that his kingdom comes without signs to be observed without outward signs. He's working in the hearts of the American people right now, maybe as great as he ever has, and they don't even know it. Right. But to me, it is a preparation and it's a revealing of just how great the harvest is going to be. Well, it's interesting and, uh, <laughs> that on the cover of your book, you don't have like pretty flowers and waterfalls on here. You have a soldier. And, and a lot of times, you know, I know that I, I, a lot of times I could prefer the pretty waterfalls and the, and, and, the, and the park and everything rather than realizing we're in a battle. But we have to adopt this, this, uh, this aspect, don't we, that we're in a battle and that we have to participate in that. Well, I think personally one of the weakest, um, I, I think, characteristics of the body of Christ today. Now, I think this weakness is going to turn into a strength. And it's going to turn fast, but it's the lack of a concept of the battle we're in, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We've been dropped behind enemy lines. We're surrounded, and uh, we're here to fight. Now, the Lord could dispel all evil for all time with a flick of his finger, but he left evil. He could have bound Satan when he was resurrected. He had purchased the earth. It was his, but he left him loose for our sake. 
We get to fight this fight. And it's something we need to understand. We get to do it. But just as King David was both perhaps the greatest worshiper of all time, he was also one of the greatest warriors. These two go hand in hand, and you cannot separate them. Yeah. Those who truly worship the Lord, he's the captain of the host. They are going to be warriors. They are going to be fighters. Right. We don't, we don't have the option to opt out. Well, let's talk about the three strongholds that you mentioned. You mentioned racism, witchcraft, and a religious spirit. So these are <laughs> they're like heavy topics right there. But let's, let's dive into the first one you bring up. Uh, we all know that racism is a problem. It's a problem in America. But tell me about the roots of racism. What is it rooted in? And why, why, is, it like, why is it such a stronghold? Well, it is founded on the two, I think, worst or greatest evils of the human heart, most powerful evils in the human heart, either pride or fear. We become racist because we have pride in the flesh. We're part of a certain race, or and there is spiritual bigotry too. We can become spiritual bigots by thinking we're better than others well, because we're part of a certain group or denomination or something like that. That's the same spirit. And it's built on pride. And then we become racist because we fear those who are different from us. Now, the Lord created every snowflake different. He made every human being different. He loves diversity. We will never be aligned with the heart of God if we don't love diversity. If we don't esteem and honor those who are different from us and show them the respect that they're due having been made in the image of God. And when we meet somebody different from us, instead of being afraid of them, where we get expectant of learning from them. That, you know, Paul didn't say he had the mind of Christ. He said we have the mind of Christ. It takes all of us together to have his mind. And I believe when he, in Genesis, said, let us make man in our image, that could have been translated mankind. It takes all of mankind to reveal the awesomeness of God. We each have our part to reveal, but, you know, nobody like we see in 1 Corinthians 13, we all see in part, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Nobody has the whole picture, so we need each other. But we also have the promise that his church, you know, when Jesus said, when he was asked about the signs of the last days or the end of the age, he said nation would rise against nation. That word translated nation is the Greek ethnos that we, we derive our English word ethnic from. Now, he was talking about ethnic conflict, not countries fighting each other. And that's going to be one of the major signs. And I think we're already there. But he also promised his church would be a house of prayer for all ethnos. And until we have that, I don't think we're going to measure up as being the temple of God that he wants to live in yet. I think that's why he poured out his Holy Spirit when those of every nation were gathered there in Jerusalem. It was for everybody. And we've got to see that. You know, one of the things, you, a phrase you used in the book that struck me was ancient cultural wounds. And there is a, a spirit of, of, of woundedness that when there's conflict between cultures that, that locks in, it seems to lock, locks in for centuries, millennia even. Can you speak to that? I mean, what, what do we do about breaking that? Well, I think we... Uh... We first need to understand that time does not heal wounds. It's a cliche and it's a false one. To be healed, a wound has got to be open, clean, cleansed. You know, uh, it's you got to put medication in to keep preventing, you know, um, you know, infection. You, you, then you've got to close it properly. And this is true of our you know, our fleshly wounds to our body, but it's also true of cultures and nations. And these wounds don't go away with time. They get infected. Now, what, one thing I think is doing that the enemy is trying to use these wounds right now 
to bring more division and all. We need to see how maybe the Lord wants to use them because the pain is coming from opening these wounds. And for us to see, these have not been healed yet. We've got to address this issue. We've got to cleanse this wound. We've got to medicate it. And then we have to close it the right way. And we're shown that in the scripture. And we have to do it that way. So uh, I see all these things that are arising now are opportunities for the gospel in this time. Fantastic opportunities for the gospel. Let's talk about something, a, a subject I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, understand the way you've described it here, witchcraft. What it really is witchcraft? Well, you know, Paul, the apostle Paul uh, named witchcraft as a work of the flesh in Galatians. Uh, it's also translated sorcery and some, but witchcraft is basically counterfeit spiritual authority. Now, I think it's, you know, we think of the black magic and the dark arts and things like that as being witchcraft, and that is a form. But I think the most deadly form is from the good side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, human goodness, <laughs> I think, has been far more deadly than the evil of that tree. Now, white witchcraft, or what I call charismatic witchcraft, not in any way implying it had to do with the charismatic movement or anything, but it's based in human charisma. It's used in manipulation, hype, control, pressuring, you know, uh, all these things. God has more dignity than to accomplish his work with those kinds of methods. That is not his, you know, his authority. And we see that the way it enters, I think we can see with King Saul on the day the kingdom was rent from him was because he was told by Sam, Samuel to wait to offer the sacrifice. But when he saw the enemies gathering and the people scattering, he caved into the pressure and offered the sacrifice. He did something he had no authority to do. He was a Benjamite. He wasn't a Levite. He wasn't qualified to offer sacrifices to the Lord. So he crossed a line beyond the sphere of authority God had given to him. And then you're on your own. And when you start trying to do things that he has not called you or commissioned you to do or to do it prematurely, you're out there on your own and you're going to have to use carnal power and all to accomplish those things, and it's going to grow. And that's why we see Saul actually spending his last night in the house of a witch. He had been operating in witchcraft for a long time, an authority that was counter to God's authority. <clears throat> well, this is kind uh, of a, a, this is like a scary place for uh, Christians uh, to be careful how they conduct themselves. You even brought up um, a point of the Christians kind of being unwittingly used by Satan to be accuser of the accusers of the brethren. You know, that's his, that's his title. How did we get involved in that? Well, you know, I believe Satan has been kicked out of heaven, but he still has access by using those who do have access. He even has us accusing one another before God. And, um, uh, and, you know, the Lord ever lives to intercede. And, you know, I think that is the, the, uh, the great power of his authority is it starts with intercession. It starts with us investing and praying for people. And then you've got an investment. And then you've got a hope. You want to see good things happen. You want to see the fruit come of that. But Satan has us, you know, one of the things he's doing is stirring us up to always accuse one another, blame one another and all. And um, yeah, it's, it's tragic, but I think right now it is my opinion, and I know the other stronghold you may want to mention, the religious spirit actually has more authority in the church today, or I should say power. There's a difference between power and authority. Satan has power in the world today 
but he doesn't have the authority. Jesus has all authority. But anyway, he's still given power, influence. And I think there's right now the religious spirit has more influence in the church today than the Holy Spirit does. And I think he, the devil's using witchcraft. He's using racism. He's using the accuser. He's using all of these things to gain domination or influence and control over Christians. So what do we do? What, what do we do as the people of God? As a, what do Tom, Angela, and Sydney do today? What does the viewer that's watching today do to be ready for the battle that may be coming from angles we don't expect? Well, I think one thing we do is we arm ourselves. We put on the full armor of God. That I think very few Christians do or have. I think we put that on. We understand we need this armor because we're in a battle. And we got to fight. And, you know, as I understand, you can't just stand up in the middle of a battle and call time out. You know, it's day and night. We are in the fight continually right now. We need to understand it. But God made us to be warriors. We should be thriving in the battle because you cannot have a victory without a battle. You cannot have a big victory without a big battle. So we should see these things as the opportunities God has made them to be. You know, James said, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. A trial is a battle. If we would go at it like, thank the Lord for this new trial, I'm going to take more ground, I'm going to grow in this, or what Peter even said, he said the testing of our faith was more valuable than gold. So if we're truly wise, we should, when we have a test coming our way, we should get more excited than if we had just found a big bag of gold. That's what he said. I think if we understood things from the heavenly, eternal perspective, we would. And if we weren't so bound to this temporary world, What's, well, let's not preach. I'm a preacher. You want to fight this? <laughs> I am telling you, Rick, you have so much goodness to share, and I wish this message could get to every person in this nation and around the world. These insights that you have are so powerful. So my question for you, Rick, is how can the believer, us, even as Tom was speaking, how can we recognize signs that perhaps witchcraft has entered into our own hearts or our own minds or the religious spirit or racism? What are some cues we can look to to ask Holy Spirit himself to come and tend to the garden of our own heart? Well, buy my books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I lay out that in this book and others too. Uh, I think there are ways that we should be discerning and recognizing. Uh, first, usually when you're being hit with witchcraft, the, the first symptom of that is depression. A darkness will start to come over you then discouragement, then despair, and uh, it just gets deeper and deeper. But if you'll recognize it and resist it, you know, if you resist Satan, he's going to flee. And that's what we should be doing. We should be chasing Satan right now, not him chasing us and attacking us. But uh, first thing, you know, light cast out darkness. These truths are clearly revealed in Scripture. That's where I got as my source for all of my books. Um, I've found, you know, I've established them, linked them clearly to scripture. It's all there. Um, you know, unfortunately, as Spurgeon once said, he could find 10 men who would die for the Bible for every one that would read it. You know, it's an open book test. We've got all the answers. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I've written about many strongholds, not just these three. I put them in booklets, and those are still very popular because you can read them in a, sit, a sitting, you know, and really grasp some of the things that are coming up against you. And, you know, once you see it, Satan starts to flee. Light casts out darkness, and just having the understanding of his schemes— 
We're not to be ignorant of his schemes. You start to discern them, you start to break their power off of your life. That's why I write books. Yeah. Well, Rick, thank you so much, Rick Joyner. He's written the book, Overcoming Evil in the Last Days. And it's a, it is a clarion call to the Christians to be aware and to be ready for battle. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rick. Good to be with you. Good to meet you guys. Good to meet you too. You know, guys, it, it's uh, the weapons of our warfare are not uh, carnal, but they're spiritual. They're powerful to the pulling down a stronghold, Sydney. You know, one thing I just was hearing uh, Dr. Rick, his whole, what he was just, the wisdom that he was pouring out is I think the biggest thing, what we do a lot of times as Christians is we will point at the world and look at them and say, this is what they're doing wrong. But in this season, I truly believe that God is saying, I need you to look at the idols in your heart. I need you to see where there's division in your heart when it comes to racism. If you, you know, cause I, that's a big thing we don't like to talk about in the church, but how is the world gonna change if we are not one? Jesus has called us to be one. So we need to look inside of our hearts. We need to look inside of ourselves, even with witchcraft, walking in a different spirit that is contrary to God. And then this religious spirit that is running rampant. These are things that I think it's really hard for us sometimes to look and see what's going on, but it's necessary because if we are crying out for revival, we're crying out for awakening, we gotta get a little cleaned up. We can't be looking all jacked up, Angela. We gotta fix ourselves, it's we gotta do truth. it. <laughs> it's the truth. I always say, if it does not look or smell of the fruit of the spirit, then it ought not to be in us. You know, and I think that's the ultimate test for everything. Our conversations, how we engage with people, how we can carry yeah. ourselves. I think so. I mean, really the answer in many cases is be the body of Christ, be a Christian, walk and act like a Christian. Learn what that is through the scriptures. Learn what that is through a relationship with God and be that person, be that healing agent to heal those cultural wounds, ancient cultural wounds. It's time, y'all. It's time <laughs> to do the deep work that we have to do and it is through Christ and Him alone. So we just encourage you today to get before the Lord, to be still, to listen to Him so He can do the deep work within you so you can go out and be the light to other people and show Christ. Have a great day. We love you. On tomorrow's Hope Today, dealing with the difficult, the dangerous, and the deadly, author and pastor Mark Atterbury identifies 25 different types of difficult church members and how to deal with them while also building a healthy church culture. That's tomorrow on Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.